first time I've ever played that song to people. Welcome to story time. We've only been here for like two hours already, but I still want to welcome you to my bit story time. I like it here. Anyway, that song, that song, right? That song is called Bajo. And it was written for and about a bunch of people that I was privileged enough to get to meet two years ago while I was in Indonesia. And the Bajo are the oldest of the indigenous people of that area of the world. They're also known by the more common name as the Sea Gypsies. Because traditionally they had a nomadic lifestyle where they just drift around with the ocean, never setting foot on land, apart from occasionally to trade with some of the people who live there. And they think the people who live on the land are a bit weird. So they didn't do that very much. And they lived perfectly peacefully on and off of and with the sea. And it worked so wonderfully. And then about 10, 12 years or so ago, the Indonesian government decided that they really should work out quite how many people they've got. So they started incentivizing the Bajo to stay put in one place. And that clashes with the Bajo way of life. So there was a little bit of resistance, and then they incentivized them some more. And uh, it, it worked out quite peacefully in the end. They incentivized them with things like, we'll build you a school, or we'll build you a health center, or give you some religion that's not yours. And now the Indonesian government know how many people they are, which is great, although the Bajo did build their settlements, their villages, in very much their own way, and they built them out of coral, which is not quite as romantic as it sounds. Beth's a marine biologist, and she's going, oh no. <laughs> because they built them out of coral with dynamite. So they just blew up areas of reef, and then built stacks out of coral rubble, and built little wooden houses on top of them, and made these whole villages out of rubble and twigs. And they're amazing places to be. But it's meant that, it's meant two things. For one, the way that they had it going, the way that they lived off the sea as they drifted around, that worked really, really well. And when they were focused in one place, the reefs around that place where they lived, because they still live exclusively off the sea, have been destroyed. Partly because they've blown it all up and to build their houses on them, partly because they've eaten all of it. Because it's the only way that they know, it's the only way that they respect. And they are resorting to more and more disastrous their methods of fishing to try to cope with the fact that they've eaten all the fish. And then it's also forcing them onto the land to trade more with the people on there. And they don't like them very much because they're a bit weird because they don't live on the sea. And it means that they're losing their culture as well to the people on the land and the fact that they're staying put. And the village that I got to go to, a village called San Pella, were the last ones to settle down. They were the longest to keep fighting for who they are. So that song that I just played for you, called Bajo, is a tribute to them. It's a tribute to the last of the sea gypsies. Anyway. Here's another song to an entirely different group of people. This is a song about you kind of people, but written about me more. Anyway, you all look like Constantinians, which I think is true. I hope you're enjoying living with the people you're living with. Because I lived with some people once, I still do, lived with different people. When I was in my undergrad, I lived in St. Andrews. And I live with four guys, and they're absolutely brilliant, I love them, but they're the most disgusting people I've ever met. <laughs> and, uh, and I didn't quite know how to cope with that. It was really weird and quite disgusting. Um, but I felt like I couldn't say anything. So I couldn't say to them, your way of living is wrong, or don't do that because it makes me feel weird, because they were fine with leaving a pan of food in the living room for weeks. So, my response to it was to do nothing. And that's not a good or advisable strategy. And one day I came home to find the house more scuzzy than I'd ever known it could be. And I cleaned it. And then I went upstairs and I wrote this song and I felt so much better. And it sort of left my mind for a while. And then a couple of weeks later I was on student radio and I played this song and told them the story without thinking. And then my housemates heard the song and were a little bit offended. Because you may agree, it's not the most flattering or complimentary of songs. Um, so I'm playing it now, partly as an apology to them for doing it so very, very wrong, and partly as um, a gesture to all of you. 
And if you do have a problem with the people who you're living with, say something. And most importantly, communicate with respect and love and compassion and that kind of stuff. Because you will live differently, that's fine. But find a mutual way around it. And just do look. You may do things differently just to put a smile on somebody else's face. But do it, because it's a lot better than the alternative. And similarly, if you find somebody doing something to put a smile on your face, and for no other reason, make sure you put a smile on your own face. This song is called The Size.
I wrote 18 months or so ago. And the day that I wrote it, I was sitting on a beach playing it and just getting my head around it. And as I was playing, along the beach came this very tall, very slender blonde guy, with slick back blonde hair. And he was wearing a black suit, and a black shirt and a black tie, and big black Ray-Bans on him, big black beats with gold rim on his ears. And he was there and just staring straight out to sea. And then all of a sudden, he was right next to me, asking me what I was playing. So, quite surprisingly, you know, I told him that I'd just written a song, it was for a girl. Um, and he asked to hear it. Um, and I played him my song, and he really liked it. And it was nice, and, and he thought it was lovely, and he blessed me. He blessed me a lot. Um, I asked him what he was doing out on the, such a beautiful day, and he looked pensively off out over the sea. And, uh, I'm just waiting for a miracle. I was all right. Yeah, that'd be good. And uh, we carried on chatting and we got on quite well. His name was Tom. He was a really nice guy. And I told him about how I was doing biology because I think the natural world is an amazing, incredible place and I wanted to learn how to save it and look after it and stuff. And he thought that was awesome. And he blessed me again. Like, he used, bless, bless you or God bless you, as much as other people use full stops, he blessed me a lot. And anyway, he said to me, Andy, if you ever need anything, Andy, you have to come and find me because then I'll help you out. And I was like, cheers, I'm not sure you need. He said, seriously, Andy, if you ever need anything, you come and find me, I'll help you out. He said, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And I said, cheers, I'm not just really, really good at you. That often come across people quite so generous. How will I come and find you? And he just looked into a big glass and went, Oh, uh, you'll find me. And they just disappeared. To this day, something about him. But every time I play this song, I'm back on the beach in the sun. Having a really nice time with this mysterious stranger. Call me.
totally mistook you for somebody else then. <laughs> Friend of mine from Lincolnshire. This is Spoon. I was like, fuck you know. Yeah, we're trapped, trapped a little bit. To be honest, Mrs. Spoon is glad that it's really you. <laughs> anyway, this, this song I'm about to play now is my newest song. Um, I only finished it the other day, but it's this occasion that I've been wanting to do it for a while. And it's about having dreams. That kind of thing. Wanting to do stuff, wanting to achieve stuff, you know, in the world. You know what it is, having ambitions and stuff. Because whatever you want to do, People want to do different things for different reasons, you know. I don't really care what people's reasons for wanting to do something are, or their reasons, or what their reasons for doing something are. I just care that they do. But anyway, whatever you want to do, you're always going, going to come across those people who tell you that you can't, and they tell you that it's going to be hard. But sometimes it's just going to be a voice in your own head telling you. Telling you that you can't, or that you shouldn't, or that it'll be hard. And I don't know where people get it from. It's, it's this perception they get, this belief that seems to justify their doubt that who you are, or what you are, or where you're from, or meaningless traits should dictate what you can and can't do. And as you go out, as you have the world in your sights, it's okay that people tell you that you can't do stuff. Let them tell you. Because that just means that it's going to feel even better when you defy them. And let people tell you that it's going to be hard. But don't you ever let them stop you.
mentioned earlier that I undergraded in St. Andrews, where there's a very long beach. It's actually a beach on which they shot chariots of fire. It's a very long beach. Okay. 
graduate, but I'm just gonna try out the real world and see what it is, see what I can do, but I have no idea. But uh, you know, I'm looking for that passion that you're talking about. Between the four of us, I mean, we're a band, and we're, we're having a lot of fun, but we want to know who we are. We, we want that direction, we want that sense of purpose, we want that passion, we want that drive. Music. I guess all we're really looking for is something to sing about. And he just looked at me. He just looked at me. And then he reached out and he picked up a guitar. Johnny. 